Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Found Friday. I'm your host, Erin Atchison. We'll be welcoming Ray back next week, as well as having some additional guests, so be on the lookout for our upcoming episodes. This week's topic is about collaboration, specifically collaborative SEO and content marketing. Whether you're an SEO, content marketer, email marketer, social media marketer, or working in paid, you want the most well-rounded data set to make your decisions. These decisions impact your budget, your resources, and how your performance is measured. That means it's important for you to have data coming from the same sources. Um, Dashboards that promote collaboration and cross-team workflows. Integrated custom data and insights modules that are actually based on kind of your your full organization and ecosystem needs. Um, And shared intelligence that spans things like competitors, content, search, and social. Collaboration is not just a single person or team's mantra. It's an organizational one. Um, We win together as an organization uh, focused on shared goals, and sometimes we lose together too. Uh, These efforts really start with the desire to share our data, our KPIs, and objectives, and then extends into our real ability to share them. And that means our platforms, process, and structure really need to match those efforts. Here at DemandSphere, we offer a suite of tools that enhance collaboration through dashboards that are built for each individual team or team member that also share data sources and workflow options um, so that everything's kind of together in one hub and you're not worried that one person's getting their data from one source and another person's getting it from another and then they don't exactly match up at the end of the day. Um, Whether you're working together with different localized sites, teams, marketing channels, Getting your ranking, organic, and competitor data from one place and sharing it across everywhere um, just makes sense. Um, So regardless of whether or not uh, you're a DemandSphere user, let's talk about ways to improve and reasons to work on collaboration in your organization. So to start out, what we're going to talk about is kind of some strategies, so ways that we can actually uh, utilize this organic data that's beneficial to the entire organization. Um, we've only got time to cover a few during the show since we try to keep our found Fridays uh, to a consumable time frame, either on your commute to work or during a lunch break um, or in between meetings. Um, but if you want more details, we're always happy to share. So for starters, the reason that we use uh, organic search data for so many things is because organic data from um, places like search and social and to some degree email really tell us what people are interested in right now. Um, It's an indicator of what it is that people want, how that's changed, and how they're describing their wants and needs natively um, in between each other, uh, to search engines, etc. The native description is so important here. Often, as marketers, we come up with these new product names, fun slogans, solution statements, and then we use those things to make content and campaign materials across, you know, our advertisements, our landing pages, our emails, articles, blog posts, and more. When we make those materials with the language that people are already using and mirror the changing wants and needs of our audience, it really improves our resonance with our target consumers. So, Within your marketing marketing organization, here are a few ideas to use your search data. Um, You can actually use your search data to fuel better paid decisions. So how do we kind of make that work? Um, When something has reached organic significance, consider reallocating budget if you're paying to promote content um, or paid search. It used to be that organic significance really meant kind of position 10 or higher, but with all of the universal search elements like knowledge panel, answer box, local pack, video, shopping, all those different things, I'd really argue that you're looking for position 5 or higher um, to be considered significant. Um, I make this suggestion because what you're looking for often with paid is kind of to get the ball rolling and start generating traffic to new content or for specific campaigns. Um, that are timely. If the content is now generating traffic organically through a high rank position, there's no need to supplement that with additional paid search or ads on the page, or you're actually paying to place an ad above where your content is already high ranking. So a lot of times this is um, 
you know, kind of just wasted money. Um, so here we actually have a data module called Content Catching Fire, and it tells you when content's rising quickly in rank so that you know first when this is occurring and can make budget change decisions faster. Now, anybody who's kind of worked in this uh, paid arena understands why you'd want to be able to make these decisions fast and first. Um, you know, when you're talking about kind of trying to optimize these decisions across hundreds or thousands of different keywords, um, if you find out even, you know, a few days, a week, a month before you might normally have gotten reporting, um, where you are either a, organically ranking well, or B, appearing in one of these universal search elements like a knowledge panel or an answer box, you may decide that you just want to go ahead and shift the budget away from that. And that adds up to, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars saved every year that you can use for other efforts um, or for better paid advertising um, in, in different other, um, for different other keywords uh, or campaigns. So, Another way that we use this uh, content catching fire option is to make better paid decisions um, So, because we show you what's catching fire for competitors. So with this information, you can see when a competitor is actually catching fire for the same keywords, topics, um, and things that you're targeting. And what that will tell you is, you know, either you want to focus some more paid efforts into that area to push them down. So kind of the opposite of what you're doing when you're catching fire. Um, or it tells you, hey, um, you know, maybe we actually don't want to keep putting paid efforts towards this because we're getting drowned out a little bit and this may be a good time to kind of reevaluate, um, you know, kind of our, our current campaign focus. So those are kind of a couple of different uh, search data um, fueling paid decision options. And again, there are tons more, um, but we do have to keep the show to a reasonable length. So let's talk a little bit about using our search data to make smarter social posting decisions. Um, right now, one of the things that everybody kind of notices is there's just this huge proliferation of hashtags being used for everything, right? And, um, you know, whether or not a hashtag actually catches on or is really used in terms of findability kind of varies from industry to industry, product to product, and even kind of community or um, specific persona to persona. Um, but one of the things that uh, I've seen be really successful is mirroring the topics and keywords that people are naturally searching for into your hashtags. Um, so what you're doing is basically taking something that somebody's already saying that they're looking for and using it when you post product things as various hashtag options. Um, when you're making your posts, uh, it's also important to use that same language to mirror, right? And you know, the psychology behind this is really um, interesting and really long. Uh, but the basic idea with that is when somebody mirrors either our body language, our speech pattern, the words that we use, colloquialisms and phrases that we, uh, you know, that we talk about, we feel like we can trust them more or we feel more inclined to listen to what they're saying. So the same thing is true of our posts on social because it's supposed to be conversational. So when we make these social posts, it's important to think, hey, when somebody was looking for or talking about this specific thing organically, how did they describe it? Because you want to describe your product solutions, whatever um, it is that you're working on marketing, back to them in that exact same way. So those are kind of a couple of ways to use search data for social and, um, you know, something that we work on here, at, uh, you know, in terms of our platform and find a lot of success in. The other things that you can do kind of around this area is using search data for campaign timelines and content decisions. So one of the interesting things that we look at uh, that I think is a missed opportunity a lot, and I, I talk about it sometimes when we do these webinars, is um, cyclical changes for content and competitors and being able to really get out ahead of it. So um, we notice that during certain times of year, um, you know, the holidays are really kind of easy and somewhat cliche example, but um, during certain times of year, obviously, there are um, just specific things that people search for. Uh, but these campaigns, 
uh, may be different for end of quarter for things like B2B or when fiscal year changes for B2B. Um, you know, there's all these different options. And if what we do is, is we actually look at those times when people may be looking for different solutions or trying to make something happen towards the end of the quarter um, or end of a fiscal year, then we can create content that matches those things at that time. Because we can also look at cyclical changes in competitors and who we're competing with as weeks, years, months, you know, quarters, et cetera, change, we can see how our competition creates content in different patterns to match audience needs as well. And we can try to get out ahead of those different timelines. Um, so there's kind of a lot of different ways that we can take that data and apply it into something that, uh, you know, somebody else would need. Outside of your marketing organization, um, there's, again, a ton of other places that you can use this. So one of the easier ones, I think, is better sales emails. Sharing your um, kind of catching fire topics with your sales team or topics where you have high rank. So, you know, when you're ranking really high for a specific uh, keyword or set of keywords, and that kind of goes into grouping, by the way, which is a whole other... Um, thing that I rant about regularly, which is creating segmentation and really good keyword and content groups. Um, and actually, I think the last two episodes are kind of covering a little bit of that, um, is when, when you're looking at these sales emails, when you're taking the content that you already naturally have, um, what algorithms uh, feel is the most relevant content to answer that question, the algorithm is mimicking what it what human intent is, right? So if you're doing really well and you've created content there, those topics and keywords are things that, um, you know, you have an answer to that already resonates with people. So including those topics um, and keywords inside of your sales email subject lines um, and headers can be really powerful uh, in terms of creating kind of, again, that like quick mirroring resonance with folks because it it continues to build that same affinity um, throughout everywhere that they have these conversations instead of getting this disjointed kind of like marketing experience, sales experience, customer service experience. Speaking of customer service, um, customer success and support improvements can be made using search data as well. Um, I think that this is an area that gets overlooked a lot um, and is part of the reason that when I talk about workflow in a second, that having a workflow that so many people in the organization can all access or at least glean some data from easily in one platform is going to be really important. Um, with customer success, what you want to know is when people are describing things in your specific uh, industry, you will also want to know what kinds of problems they're having so that you can get out ahead of that. Whether you're an account manager or a technical support person, these can help you create better account management emails, better account management phone calls, better check-ins about topics to bring up, better onboarding processes if you're in kind of a SaaS space, right? Like how do you know what problems people are having um, regularly? Uh, you can kind of look at some of this stuff and this obviously integrates with your probably your own CRM and help desk data, right? Um, is this is another layer a lot of times where if somebody's not necessarily looking for or complaining about your platform, product, service, etc., directly within your platform, you can garner this information from outside sources. And a lot of times they're going to be a little bit more honest there. So obviously search data is one place that you can do that, but social is another really great place, right? So this goes into kind of the social listening area that, um, you know, has really exploded over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. But this social listening concept of what are people asking about in forums? How are people um, describing their problems when they're on, uh, you know, Twitter or Facebook um, or LinkedIn helps you create better FAQs, helps you create better resource and knowledge centers, um, and, you know, can really help you do, like I said, better onboarding. And onboarding is so vital to um, helping people get to know your get to know your products um onboarding is funny too because i think when people think of onboarding they they typically think of like a software um type of a platform but onboarding can also be things 
now, like, um, I'll use prose help hair care, um, as a good example. So there've been all of these new, uh, examples of, um, health, beauty, fitness things really kind of exploding on stuff like Instagram, um, Facebook and Pinterest through videos. And, um, now you can get all these things in the mail. So whether this is mail order fashion, mail order beauty, mail order healthcare, mail order fitness, whatever the situation is, you onboard your customers into that experience. Um, Pros Healthcare like sends you a box. It's got beautiful instructions, tells you everything that's inside of the um, hair care product, tells you how often to use it based on a specific quiz you took, um, tells you uh, how many pumps of each product to use, um, and makes other suggestions to kind of onboard you and then follows back up like and make sure that you understand and that it seems like it's working well for you. Um, other places like M.M. Lafleur, who does uh, mail order like fashion that's higher end, um, is catering to typically a more high end business uh, woman in terms of helping with wardrobe, but they assign you a stylist, onboard you into the program. This concept of onboarding is, um, you know, really a lot bigger than just software platforms and things like that these days. So I think it's important to know like what your onboarding process is and how you can apply these best practices to that. Um, you know, kind of the last thing that's a little bit outside of your marketing area is product development. Um, Obviously, listening to what people are searching for and how they're describing it, not just in specifically your industry, because obviously you already know about most of those things, but adjacent to your industry, right, can really give you uh, new product ideas or ways to enhance things that are kind of on the periphery of where you're already building up an audience. Um, so if you're kind of looking at how these two things maybe work together uh, you may find a find a great way to expand or to improve current product offerings. So I think that that's, um, you know, again, another way to get that data in front of folks that, you know, you're paying for the data and you're collecting it. Um, and somebody's, somebody's got access to all this information. It's so important to collaboratively look at how we can utilize it. Um, so that brings me back to this workflow idea. Um, obviously here we feel really strongly about collaboration. And so we don't charge you extra for extra users. You can have as many as you want. Um, we also don't charge you extra for custom dashboards um, and custom reports. But one of the things that I think is interesting about this idea is, so we allow you to make these custom dashboards, right? And custom dashboards can be anything from content ideation, competitor discovery, recommendations, and you know, search engine optimization, to-do lists, um, you know, or email subject line, thoughts, whatever it might be. And then different teams can log in to just the dashboards that are important to them and garner that information, but it's all coming from a similar source. Um, I think that, you know, if you're not, like I said, if you're not a customer here, I think that these are solutions that you can work on implementing inside of your existing platform or, or own organization through um, shared spreadsheets, shared dashboards, um, additional logins, and then explaining to people, um, you know, who are outside of maybe the specific SEO organization or content organization, how specific parts of the data are relevant to them. Um, and if you have time, obviously pulling it for them. One, one of the reasons we like and kind of created this idea of, you know, custom dashboards that are, you know, workflow related is because it allows you to pull just the modules that are relevant to that particular um, person's or team's job function. So they're not kind of wading through all of these different um, all of these different uh, pages or platform modules or data views and things. Um, it's kind of set up specifically for them. So if you are using a tool that allows you to do that, um, that's usually a really you know fast way to kind of get in there. Um, I think that another great thing to do in terms of uh, enhancing your workflow around stuff like this is to do a quick discussion with folks around some of the ideas that you have on how to use the data um, and then provide them some of the data and say, hey, I'd love to check back in in 30, 60, 90 days, however long, um, and see if this actually was helpful. If it is, like, let's find a way to keep doing it. Um, you know, collaboration, like we said, it's 
it really needs to start at the top of your organization, but anyone can start improving collaboration and um, you know some of the ideas that we gave you today for how to take this data and utilize it to make better paid uh, social campaign and content decisions and then even outside of your marketing organization like we said sales emails customer success and support product development all of these improvements um, you know even if you only make one of them uh, should have a really positive impact on your overall organization so that's all the time that we have for today's show. Um, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to next week when Ray is back with us and we've got some guests joining. So we will keep you posted on those and we will see you soon.